Good morning and welcome to worship with Kaiser Christian Church Community. We're so happy to have you join us this morning. Let's begin our time of worship together with music. There's no place where we can't find peace. There's no end to amazing grace. Take me in with your arms spread wide. Take me in like an orphan child. Never let go, never leave my side. I join us in the call to worship this morning. Did you hear the good news? The kingdom of God has drawn near. Do you trust the good news? We place trust in Jesus, the one who calls us to follow him. Do you have the courage to leave your former lives behind? We put our faith in the Lord, our rock and and our salvation. Trust the Lord. We will follow Jesus. Will you pray with me? Teach us a new rock of our salvation, how your kingdom has come near. As you called Simon and Andrew long ago, call us to be your disciples this day that we might find refuge and strength as we face the destructive forces of our lives. Grant us the strength to wait for you in silence, that we might meet you in the subterranean chambers of our souls. For in you we rest secure. In you we abide in holy love. Amen.
we have a chance now to come before God and one another in prayer this morning, to lift up our prayers of thanksgiving and our prayers of concern to a God who listens, a God who hears us and responds. I just heard one piece of good news, an update on one of the people we've been holding in prayer uh, these last couple weeks. Our friend Mike uh, is returning home from the hospital this, uh, this morning, sometime today. I know he's glad uh, to be back home and appreciates all of our continued prayers for his recuperation following his surgery. Let us take a moment this morning in prayer to lift up our blessings and our concerns to God. Gracious and holy God, God who is ever present, surrounding us with your Holy Spirit, God with us, God of comfort and healing. We lift up these prayers of thanksgiving, these prayers of concern and supplication to you this day in the midst of worship surrounded by your presence ever conscious of our being your beloved creation we thank you for the ways that you bless us the love that you surround us with, the inspiration that you provide, the continuing call to be your people in the world. We lift up into your loving care those we continue to pray for this morning. Those who are struggling with health and recuperation, those who mourn the loss of loved ones. We pray your healing touch upon all of these, your children, whom we love and care for. We ask that you continue to inspire us to be a form of your presence of comfort and healing for them. Help us to know the ways that we can best be a comfort to your people. Inspire us to go beyond ourselves having the courage to change on our way along this journey of life. Lord, we come to you each week as your body of Christ in prayer with thanksgiving and supplication, and we will continue to do so. You sent your Son Jesus into the world to save us. We continue to wonder and to ponder the intricacies of what that truly means. We do so in our daily lives, in our words, and our actions. 
we do so as we come to you in prayer each week. You sent your Son into the world to show us the way. May we continue to follow. Let us continue in worship this morning as we pray the way your Son taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I lost my keys in the great unknown And call me please, cause I can't find my phone This is the stuff that drives me crazy This is the stuff that's getting to me lately In the middle of my little mess I forget how big I'm blessed This is the stuff that gets under my skin, but I've got to trust. You know exactly what you're doing. It might not be what I would choose. This is the stuff you use. stuff that drives me crazy. This is the stuff that's getting to me lately in the middle of my little mess. I forget how big I'm blessed. This is the stuff that gets under my skin, but I've got to trust. You know exactly what you're doing. It might not be what I would choose. This is the stuff you use. So break me of impatience, conquer my frustrations, I've got a new appreciation, it's not the end of the world, oh, oh, oh. oh. this is the stuff that drives me crazy, this is the stuff someone saved me in the It's under my skin and I've got to trust You know exactly what you're doing It might not be what I would choose This is the stuff you use This is the stuff you use Join me this morning in praying a blessing upon our young ones and children in our community. Holy God, we continue to be humbled by the great responsibility and trust you place in us in watching over these young ones. We pray your continued blessing upon them that they might every single day of their lives be aware of and reminded that they are your beloved creation. That as the song this morning reminds us, Jesus loves them. That they are surrounded by your divine presence whenever and wherever they are. Amen.
scripture this morning comes from the book of Mark, where we get to hear, in parallel to last week's passage from John, we get to hear Mark's uh, telling of the calling of the first disciples. Now, Mark's version is a little bit different. You remember me saying last week that it's often difficult to compare the Synoptic Gospels, of which Mark is one, and the Gospel of John. They're written in such different styles and with different focuses in mind. And and here we get some indication of that with, with Mark's telling. He's descriptive in a different way from John. His imagery is, is rich. We get a little bit more background, if you will, on on who these people are. We get this use of the word immediately, which Mark employs throughout his gospel, giving this sense of almost an even divine urgency around the story of Jesus and what is happening. All of the reactions to what Jesus says and does are many of times are immediate. In this passage, we come at a point in Jesus' story where he has been baptized. He has spent 40 days in the wilderness being tempted. He has been waited on by angels. And now we come to verse 14 of Mark chapter 1, the beginning of Jesus' ministry in the place of Galilee. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat, mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men followed him. Whenever I read this passage, I can't help but think about, as I think most people, this phrase that has become almost a part of our general culture, this phrase that is immediately recognizable by those even outside of the church. I will make you fishers of people or fishers for people. This calling and invitation to what amounts to a missionary life of evangelism. And speaking as a former missionary in the classic understanding, but I want to make the point clear that we are all missionaries. We all have this mission from God. But in that traditional understanding, I spent some time in places around the world in this vocation. And I ran into folks who we had some disagreement on how it should be done. I'm always reminded of those different 
methodologies when I consider this passage. I'm reminded specifically of some folks when Kim and I were working in Mozambique, the way that we were invited to work with our Christian partners in that country, our brothers and sisters in the United Church of Christ in Mozambique, providing resources and walking alongside them in the ministry God had called them to. We came into contact with folks from other agencies and, and, and other churches and denominations who did their work quite differently than us. And we had a lot of conversations with them around what was the right way to do things and, and called most of them friends and colleagues and had positive interactions with them, but didn't always agree with how they were doing it. And I'm thinking of, in particular, one sort of way that I that I noticed multiple groups engaging in this call and interpretation of being fishers for people. They would come out from their walled compounds with riding in, in vehicles that that nobody that they worked with could ever afford, and they would come out packed with supplies and resources and and all the training they could muster, and they drive out as far as they could get, usually in a day. And they would set up a video screen and speakers and generators, and and they would usually show some kind of some version of an evangelistic film or, or what is even titled sometimes the Jesus movie depicting the gospel story. Hopefully in the language of the people that they were going to visit, but sometimes not. They would usually hand out some bags of rice and, and other supplies. And there would be an altar call of sorts after showing the film and, and interacting for the day. And they would, for lack of a better term, they would collect converts to Christianity. And they would go out and show the film, give an altar call, and they'd write down the numbers of people that had committed their life to following Jesus. And then in a couple of weeks, they would come back to that same area or an area near there, and they would do it again and count up their numbers, and they would send these statistics back to their sending churches. Many of the numbers being, in fact, repeat converts who would always raise their hand after the movie. And I would ask them about how effective they thought that they were being and, and if they had any relationship with the, the leaders in those communities or the people there, if they knew who they were, what their struggles were, the injustices they faced, the challenges in their daily lives. And they sometimes had some idea, but they would always return back to their compounds at the end of the day, being isolated and removed from the people they profess to be there to help. And if, I found after a while that their, their actions and their methodology was based on what I would say is a too literal interpretation of those words, I'll make you fishers for people. Because in, in the literal interpretation, we, we hear that phrase, fishers for people, and we, we understand that in the terms of, of fishing, it's about getting as many fish in the boat as you can, right? That's your one goal as a fisher. And they applied that same concept to their missionary endeavors. Now, 
don't get me wrong, we want as many people to hear the good news of Jesus as possible. We want people in the boat, so to speak. But having that single-minded laser focus on collecting converts is at least a short-sighted interpretation of Jesus' words, if not a much too literal one, and sometimes misguided. This phrase, I will make you fish for people, at once is an active phrase. It's not something we can do just sitting in a pew or being the best Christian that we can be in any passive sort of sense. It's an active sort of thing. But this phrase, as we have classically interpreted it as being purely evangelistic in nature, going out and telling the gospel story as the only way that we share the gospel is, is maybe not necessarily the only way that we can understand it. Take, for instance, the, the ideas from theologian Ched Myers tells us that it, this phrase is not only to mean a saver of souls, so to speak. But that the image of the fisher for people is, is in fact taken from Jeremiah 16, 16, where it's used as a symbol for Yahweh's censure of Israel. In other places in Scripture, this hooking of fish sort of idea or image is in fact a euphemism for judgment upon the rich from the book of Amos, or the powerful in Ezekiel. Jesus is in fact telling the disciples, I'm going to make you seekers for justice and equity. As you share the story of the good news of God. Jesus is inviting common folk to join him in his struggle to overturn the existing orders of power and privilege. It's a very different idea, isn't it, from simply going out and collecting converts and calling it a day. You see, Jesus' mission is seeking justice is, is interwoven with that concept of saving souls. And it's not an either-or that we have to choose from here, but it is a both-and that we have to understand. It's not one at the expense of the other, or one to be leaned towards over another, but that they fit together, this seeking justice and sharing the gospel or saving of souls. It is a both and. It's a concern for body and soul. Because the kingdom of God, as Jesus says, is near. It's not some far off heavenly realm only, but is also an imminent reality for the here and now. It is, in fact, good news because it promises justice for the oppressed and repentance for the wayward oppressors. An opportunity for true community beyond mere collecting of converts to a religion. Jesus' mission was salvation.
we must stop thinking that those are the same thing. That that converting to a religion and salvation are one and the same. Because if we truly look at the Jesus' mission in and through the gospel stories, that salvation was not only comprised of the words shared about the truth of God and who Jesus was. Jesus was also concerned with the injustice of disparity and inequity within the culture he found himself in, the people that he traveled with and came into contact with. In the terms of salvation, concern for justice and equity alongside the condition of your soul are, are inseparable. Think about your own individual experience. If you're if you're struggling in depths of poverty, and surrounded by iniquity and injustice, what is the condition of your soul going to be? Even if you have heard the good news of Jesus, how can you give that thought and time and energy if your main concern is not starving. If your main concern is the abject oppression that you experience. We must understand that our identities as citizens of God's kingdom are inextricably linked. When we talk about being the body of Christ or the family of God, it's not just people in the church or people that have heard and believed that message. But all of us, we are inextricably linked. The power wielders and the powerless. The oppressors and the oppressed and everybody else in between. We are intimately connected, whether we want to recognize it or not. The power wielded by one, or the injustice and oppression felt and experienced by the other, has an impact on the rest of us. Denying that only intensifies the potential negative impact thereof. Jesus calls us all to repentance in this passage, to what could better be or more fully be defined as a changing of lives and hearts. Because that act of repentance, we, we balk at that, don't we? We, we put up defenses against repentance because there's always that connecting like well what do I need to repent of I've done nothing wrong but repentance has that defining element in it of of turning of a course correction of a change and that's what we're truly wary of isn't it changing changing our hearts and having it have an impact on our lives in the form of further change in actions and priorities. 
But that is what Jesus calls us to in this simple word. Repent. Change our lives and our hearts to more clearly align with God's. A God who loves justice and mercy. Jesus also calls us to belief in the very same phrase. Belief that, well, belief rather in a kingdom that is at once now and not yet. One that we have some part in making a reality on this earth. We must believe it is possible to believe in a God big enough who loves us enough to believe that we are capable of the kind of change that it will take. And most of all, to believe that it is all truly good news. The repentance, the belief, the call to mission in the world is all good news. Sometimes difficult to hear, often very hard to do. Speaking of that repentance piece again. That change in direction as we journey through life, the course corrections that we are called to, to keep us aligned with God. It is sometimes difficult, sometimes too hard, for us to conceive, but it is good. You see, Jesus came into this world from the very beginning of his ministry. He declares it even amidst the mystery surrounding him. Jesus declares his intention. He came into this world seeking to reconcile God and humanity. relationship broke. He began by choosing common people. Fishermen on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. Choosing them to join him in this urgent mission. Something he continues to do to this day. Choosing common people to join in his great mission. These disciples called from their everyday lives, conditions, abilities, levels of faith to help bring the kingdom come. God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We read that prayer and recite it so readily each Sunday. But let us take a moment to slow down And recall what is being said and professed. This kingdom of God that Jesus speaks of, this kingdom come. The God whose kingdom it is, that God's will be done. Not some other time or place or after we're dead and in heaven with God, but on earth. Here and now, just as it is in heaven. Jesus invited these first disciples to change. Not simply a shift in their vocation from fishermen casting nets to wayward travelers and teachers, followers of their rabbi. Not simply a shift in vocation from dis fisherman to disciple, or for us from, from our daily jobs or careers to some more overtly Christian vocation or 
or not, but but a true identity shift. This is what sort of change Jesus invites those first disciples and us too. Jesus changes who you are. Or at least who you're aware of yourself to be. The condition of your very soul and those of everyone else is in question. Who do you think you are? So Jesus came to transform us into who we truly are. To fully recognize our identity as the beloved of God. And to recognize that same identity in every single other person that we meet. And the ones we don't meet. The ones who we're never going to meet. The ones that we're aware of. But every single person on this earth is God's beloved creation. Whether we like them or not, agree with them or not, love them as we should or not, how we understand that word love or misunderstand. This is who we are. We are that beloved of God who seek God's justice and mercy in the world. We are the ones who go beyond telling the story of Jesus as good news by engaging in his same mission in the world of shifting the orders of power and privilege of our broken society so that all can live a life of abundance. Truly, Jesus came to show us the way. The way to love, to care for one another, to even conceive of a world in which God's justice is paramount. To repair humanity's broken relationship with God. To reconcile us. In this way, Jesus came to save us. To offer himself on the cross for this salvation. Jesus indeed had an urgent mission. One that has passed on to his disciples just as it did to these first disciples thousands of years ago. So it has passed on to us. To not only communicate the good news of God's kingdom in word and story and any manner of written, spoken, signed communication we can conceive of, not only in those ways, but purposefully with our actions. Challenging the status quo of injustice when we see it. Engaging in the hard work of repentance when we've become a part of the systems of inequity and injustice in our world, in our communities, our towns, our neighborhoods. Being willing to change, not only for our own benefit, and here's, here's the real clincher. Change is hard enough when we know it's going to benefit us personally. But being willing to change not only for our own benefit, but for the benefit of somebody else. That's something that we almost cannot hope to do on our own. Thankfully, that is not what is required.
but to engage in that change for the benefit of others with the inspiration and the power of the Holy Spirit guiding and leading us, empowering us in that holy work. Changing for the benefit of others, the truly oppressed, the literal and figurative widows and orphans of our societies. Reading this passage, I think we sometimes wonder how, in fact, these first disciples, Simon, soon to be called Peter, Andrew, James, John, how these first disciples were able to simply drop their livelihoods, leave their father and their workers, and to follow Jesus. For the best answer I can come up with, I'm thinking we've got to go back again and look at Jesus' words in verse 15. Jesus says, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. These first disciples were somehow by the grace and empowerment of God able to do just that. to become inspired by the possibility of God's indwelling kingdom by the power of the Holy Spirit. They repented, changing their hearts and their lives, repenting of their own short-sightedness. There are sometimes misconceived notions about what is true or even good. They embraced belief in what Jesus was saying and continued to believe all that they would see and hear. They acted. Informed by belief and inspired by divine transformation and forgiveness they worked to not only talk to people about Jesus, to share their experience with the divine, but to be an image of Jesus in the world. To do the same work that Jesus did. To promote positive change in our world now. I pray that we may all be so inspired and blessed to be used by God in such a way. May God's Holy Spirit continue to inspire all of us to repentance, to changing our hearts and lives, to continuing to being able to do so seeking God's guidance and inspiration for this hard work. Changing our hearts and lives for the better, and in so doing, increasing our belief and our actions to do justice, to love mercy, To walk humbly with God. Amen.
Let's continue in our worship this morning as we sing our hymn of response. Jesus calls us o'er the tumult of our lives while restless soundeth, saying, Christian, follow me. Long ago, apostles heard it by a Galilean lake. Turned from home and toil and kindred, leaving all for his dear sake. Jesus calls us from the worship of the child all that would keep us saying christians love me more in our joys and in our sorrows days of toil and hours of ease still he calls in cares and pleasures christians love me more than these jesus calls us by thy mercies saviors may Seems when we focus on worship, we often think of this as a time to be fed. We might not actually bring silverware with us, but I can imagine many of us eager to fill up with scripture, prayer, music, and good news. Important opportunity to prepare the challenges which lie ahead. How I how glad I am that every time we connect for worship, even though it's over the internet, there is also a moment for stewardship. Today, it's important that we are encouraged not only to hold our spoon, but to bring a soup ladle. After all, a spoon is what we use to feed ourselves. A ladle is what we use to serve others. Today, with the echo of Jesus' voice calling his first disciples, let us bring our ladles to serve those yearning for good news, for love, for the assurance of God's presence. Ladles up. What are you dishing out with your offering today? Will you bow in prayer with me? God, we thank you for this time for our own eyes can be opened once again, and our hearts challenged to act out our claim. We are disciples of Christ. Please receive the gifts we have offered here today, the checks and coins, along with our confession that we want to follow Jesus. Take all which has been laid out before you and multiply it intensify our inner desire to care act in love as jesus responded to those he encountered and keep reminding us of the gifts you provide that we may not be ladle centered people this day and in the days to come amen We consider this morning Jesus' call to those first disciples and all of that they were asked to engage in, to engage in acknowledging the imminent and indwelling kingdom of God, to repent and to believe. 
to acknowledge ourselves the difficulty that we face sometimes in that call to repentance, acknowledging even the reasons or the things we have to repent of. Thinking of our journeys through life and how paths are often winding. I imagine sometimes it feels like driving down the road and if we wait to make a course correction until it's been too long, the correction feels quite drastic. But that's not how we drive, is it? When you're driving and trying to keep a path straight, you're making minute corrections almost constantly, aren't we? We don't just take our hands off the wheel for 20 minutes at a time and then come back and say, oh, I've got to get back on the right track. I think that's kind of a little bit the way that Jesus intends for us to approach our own repentance. One of the clues in my saying that is that Jesus offers us and gifted us with this very table of communion, a table that we often associate with, and rightly so, with relationship with Jesus and with God, our Creator. A table that we often connect with repentance of turning away from that which draws us away from right relationship with God. For us disciples, this isn't a table that we come to once or twice a year with great course corrections needing to be made before we approach. No, our repentance is something that we can engage in on even a daily basis, making small course corrections to keep our relationship with God in line, continuing on that course of positive change for our lives and our hearts as we devote our lives to Jesus' urgent mission in the world doing justice, loving mercy, and walking humbly with God. This is at once a table of renewing relationship, of transformation. Of community. The invitation, just like the call that Jesus gave his first disciples is for all of us. The invitation to come, to follow, to be transformed. Let us pray today. Paul wrote to the people of Corinth, alternating between encouragement and chastisement. A statement. Over and over, he reminded them of a new world breaking in. Today, I invite you to put on your Paul glasses so you can see, hear, and taste the new world here at this table. From now on, let us even though who let even those who are wealthy be as though we have no money. Let those caught in the anxieties of COVID challenges be as though all the world were healthy. Let those who are fear-filled because of unrest and violence drink in what is offered here. For here, it is the Lord of life who welcomes all, wealthy and poor, healthy and ill, anxious and free. You are welcome, not because of your age or race, your height or weight, your peace or torment. You are welcome because 
present form of this world is passing away. Come, this is the training table for the new world coming. Having committed ourselves to lives of repentance and belief, and following Jesus, we answer the invitation and call to this communion table, renewing and maintaining a relationship with Jesus. We remember that night when he met with his disciples, these disciples drastically transformed in heart and life by their time on earth with Jesus. He meets with them and he takes a simple piece of bread, he blesses it, and he breaks it for them, giving it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body broken for you as often as you eat it you remember me in like fashion he takes the cup and after giving thanks he pours it out for them saying this is the cup of the new covenant poured out for forgiveness of sin as often as you drink it, you remember me. Let us join in Holy Communion together as the body of Christ this morning. At whichever table we find ourselves at, we are one. I have a couple of announcements from our member Sue Day, who works with the folks that organized the Kaiser Community Dinner. Uh, she wanted me to let everybody know that they are having another drive through dinner uh, this Wednesday, the 27th, from 3 to 6 p.m. So that's uh, over at uh, St. Edward's Catholic Church on River Road, if you'd like to participate in that community dinner um, drive through and pick up uh, some dinners uh, from 3 to 6 on Wednesday. And if you're interested in um, helping uh, put that on, they need some helpers to prepackage part of that meal on Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. So if you're able and willing to 
to help in that effort of um, packaging the dinners on Wednesday morning, uh, go ahead and um, call into the church office and we'll put you in connection with Sue that can give you more instruction about that. And with that, let's all join together in singing our hymn of benediction this morning. the call.